A full stack application is only as strong as its weakest link. So if your website has a single gap in its security, as your user base grows, so will the amount of bad actors trying to attack your website. And so inevitably, the gap will be found and exploited. There's a common timeline that happens every time a, a, a service or a, a startup or a website is launched, which is in the beginning, you don't have a lot of money to invest in security and probably not a lot of money to invest in programmers that specifically deal with that. But to balance it out, you also don't have a lot of users trying to hack your website. But as your user base grows, the number of people trying to attack you will grow as well. And thus you need to start investing more into security. So in my opinion, even though you will eventually start growing, but there are some things that you can actually do to make sure that your website is safe right from the beginning. And in this video, we're going to be covering uh, both from, from the front end perspective and from the back end perspective, different things you can do to make sure almost like a checklist to make sure your website is as safe as it can be. So before we get into the video, if you could leave a like and subscribe, I would massively appreciate it. And let's get into the video. Okay, so for the front end part, let's start with one of the most simple things that everyone knows, which is to work on authorization. So for those who don't know what this is, basically any website has pages, which should be accessible for some users, but not accessible for others. An example in this is, for example, uh, a Facebook account. An example of this is, for example, a Facebook account is should only be accessible by users who are friends with that account. So in its core, what Facebook probably does is it has a route for a user's account. And whenever someone tries to access that URL, Facebook will probably check to see if that user satisfies a certain count of permissions. And those permissions probably include something like if the user is friends with that account. So in the front end, what you probably want to do is have some sort of way to protect your different routes so that they are only accessible by those accounts that have those permissions. I'm putting in the screen right now uh, a little bit of, of code in React, which is the example I'm using, uh, where you basically create a route for a specific URL and you pass in a way to check to see if that user has the permission to access that route. In this case, what we're doing is we're just checking to see if the user is authenticated so because in this example, the user needs to be logged in in order to access this specific route. So what we can do is before we render the page or before we actually show what is in the page, we check to see if the user is authenticated. And if not, we can redirect the user to the login page. This is a very simple example of how authorization works. And a lot of authorization should actually happen in the back end. And we'll cover that later. But this is really important because then you can get your website and protect users from accessing things that they shouldn't be accessing. The second thing I really want to talk about in relation to front end is input sanitation and validation. Now this one I've actually talked about in the past a couple times. I have a whole video on how to make your react application safer if you want to check that out. And I go in depth about this. But basically, what input sanitation and validation is, is you have inputs in your website, right? For example, you are creating an account, you're registering a user. Imagine that in a user, as you can see on the screen, uh, there are inputs for age, for name, for email, for password, for all of that. In the front end, you need to make sure that what the user is actually putting in those inputs is the correct data and the correct data type that you require that input to have. So we are making sure that uh, when someone is submitting uh, data to an API from this form, they'll actually send numbers for the age field instead of letters. A common example of this is allowing users to uh, put emails into an email form and uh, getting back some sort of user feedback saying that the email, if the email is valid or not. Now, one thing you should know, and this is actually one of the most important things I should say about security in a full stack app as a whole, is you should never trust any data that comes from the front end. So whenever you have an input or a form and you send that data from the front end to the back end, you need to also validate that in the back end. And I'll go in depth on that when we get to the back end part. But um, a lot of people will probably hear me saying this about front end and be like, well, you should do this in the back end. But in my opinion, you should do this in both uh, front end and the back end because in the front end you can protect the user experience as well. Now also finally protecting the user uh, the user's input in the front end can protect 
uh, the website against XSS uh, attacks, which basically is a type of cybersecurity attack where a user can inject JavaScript code into a website by directly writing it in an input. There's so many examples of it. I'm probably playing one in the screen right now where something like this can happen. And you can try it out. If you don't protect your inputs, you can just write JavaScript and uh, the code will probably execute it. So you really need to do this. Um, it's very simple, really easy, and it's almost like a standard. So please do this in every website. Now, the last thing I want to talk about front end is because, uh, like I said, a lot of security comes from the back end compared to the front end, um, is that you need to have some good error handling. So by that, I just mean in the front end, whenever you get a service error, you need to display the correct error message. Don't display too much information, right? Display something that is enough to show the user that something bad happened, but not enough such that the user will get insight on how your service is built. Now, there's not a lot more you can do with uh, front end security measures, because like I said, a lot of it is in the back end. However, if you're interested in a more in depth uh, re video related to this, again, uh, I know that's just this video specifically is just about react but you can check out my how to make react your react app safer video and you can look at that and get a better idea but now let's talk about the backend so for the backend the first thing i need to say is secure your api endpoints and by that i mean tokens i mean oauth i mean uh having middlewares that check uh required information i mean you get it things that will protect every endpoint you have and by securing your api endpoint i basically mean um protecting it against uh, people pretending to be someone else. So for example, a really, really easy example is in Node.js, you can create a middleware uh, that validates some sort of token. In this case, uh, it can be a JSON web token and see if the user, uh, the users uh, making the request has the, the correct token. It will validate that token to see if the user making the request is the user that should be making the request. You know what I mean? So you can check that. And if it doesn't actually match, you can prevent the endpoint from being accessed. Now at this stage, you can also protect your endpoint by validating if the data coming from the front end is actually valid. So here is where you should also do some sort of uh, input validation. Um, an example is using a library called Yup. I have a video on how to actually validate your backend data through Yup, and you can just check it out if you want to. What you're going to basically do is, again, if you're going to send data to your database, if you're going to send data anywhere in your backend, you need to check first to see if that data is malicious or if it's actually the kind of data you want, right? So you can validate that. And if it doesn't, if it's not actually correct, you can return an error. Now, the second thing I want to talk about backend is securing your database in the best way possible. So first, I'm going to say sec create compact queries if you're using some sort of query uh, like database management system um, so that they are kind of compact and actually just give back the desired outcome. Um, to do stuff like that, I actually like to use GraphQL uh, to be as a layer in between the front end and the back end because then um, I can just specify what kind of data I want. I don't have to create a billion endpoints um, to just send back a, a little bit of data and prevents me from actually creating endpoints that return too much data. Uh, there's arguments in favor and against GraphQL, and I'm not going to get that in the there on this in the video, but um, it's something that I actually recommend, and I think it can actually help you with situations like this. Also, I would rec highly recommend setting up some sort of uh, protection against who can read and write into your database. So if you've used um, databases uh, like MongoDB uh, with services like MongoDB Atlas or uh, even Firebase, you can actually set up different rules on who can write and read your database. So if a user is using your website, right, and they are in, I don't know, let me give an example here, if they are in Canada, right, and for some reason, you don't want any user from Canada to be able to use your website, not only can you um, prevent <laughs> people from the IP that is in Canada from accessing your website, but you need to also protect um, the people with a Canadian IP from accessing your database. Because even if they can uh, bypass the website or something fails in that end, you have to check all of those things in your database system. You can also check to see if a user is authenticated in there or if a user exists in the database before allowing them to make any changes to it. Uh, this is also important when you're trying to make very big database changes so you can actually create 
what is known as admin privileges and allow specific users to make uh, changes into your database that are different uh, from a different perspective, right? So I recommend doing this. Uh, I have a video on how to do that in Firebase if you want to check it out. But whatever database you're using, I do recommend you doing this. Now, all of the sanitation and input validation that I mentioned before in the front end and in the back end should protect your database as well. They were all meant to also protect your database. There are a lot of different attacks related to databases. The most old example is uh, an SQL injection and validating and sanitizing your inputs is how you protect against that. But there are thousands of other types of attacks that you have to protect against. So doing all those preventive measures are extremely important. Now, the third thing I want to talk about is error handling and status codes. I can't emphasize this enough. You have to handle your errors correctly, especially if you're working with backend stuff. So what I would recommend is uh, setting up whenever you're creating your API, a detailed list of what kind of errors you want to use uh, and their corresponding uh, status codes, and then maintaining those whenever you send back data from an API. So that means that every time I create a service or an API for a specific thing, I'll have a list of all the errors possible and their respective status, code, status codes. I'll probably put that into like an object. Um, and whenever I find error situations inside of my API, I'll return the correct ones. But at the same time, you also have to be careful with the kind of messages you're sending back in your request. Remember, if you send too much information about how your database looks like, or how your API looks like in your request, in the front end, you can easily just access that by going to the network tab. So you have to prevent messages from being too clear. Now, if if you don't error handle in the back end, you can possibly even break your API. And that is not something that you want to do. So uh, please make sure you do so to prevent this kind of stuff from happening. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is rate limiting, which is uh, just a concept of preventing people from abusing your API by making billions of requests, right? So again, as your website scales, usually uh, your your, like your server will need to scale too. If you're using like uh, AWS uh, service, you'll they are, there are measures for you to scale that up automatically. Um, and a lot of providers will do that for you too, because obviously you wanna provide uh, as uh, enough um, bandwidth for your users to be able to access your website. So even though there's a lot more requests coming in, you also wanna scale up your, uh, your system to match that, right? But the problem is, uh, when an, a huge influx of users using your website sometimes can be good, uh, when there's a huge influx of requests coming from a single user, that's pretty bad. Because that means that someone is trying to either bot uh, your API to break it or uh, doing something to see if they can exploit your website. So what you need to do is check to see uh, if a user is making a bunch of requests in a short amount of time and if all those requests are coming from the same domain. So what I recommend is for you to use some sort of service. Uh, an example of something I use or I've used in the past uh, in Node.js, it's been a while since I've used it. Uh, so I don't know if I recommend because I don't make APIs in Node.js anymore. But uh, one thing that I used was the express rate limit library. I can put a little uh, code uh, example in the screen of how you would do something like this. Uh, you would basically just set up uh, a window in milliseconds of how long you want to check to see between requests. So like if a user make makes like a 1000 requests in 60 seconds, that can be the window 60 seconds. Um, and then you can also put a max amount of requests. So it could be a 1000, it can be 100, it can be 10, it can be whatever you want. And finally, you need to give back a message um, to the user letting them know that, um, that they're, they're not allowed to continue making the request. And you would apply that as a middleware so that there is this check happens every time uh, you have an endpoint. So in every endpoint you have, whenever you have a request, it checks to see if this is happening. And again, this will prevent against a very common type of attack called a DOS attack or a denial of service attack. And it's actually pretty simple to address it. And I don't see a lot of people doing it for some reason uh, when they're starting up um, a website. But yeah, that's that's pretty much it uh, for the, the things I wanted to talk about in this video. And I also want to open up the floor for you guys to talk about different uh, measures that you guys take. I obviously didn't include some big things like just constantly testing your website, constantly having uh, integration tests, having um, even uh, having people constantly trying to hack your website. 
Uh, that would be great because you can find br uh, breaches, but at the same time, it's expensive, right? And if you want to find a cost efficient way to do that is actually try to hack your own website. That's something that I used to do. There's this website called hackthissite.com. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but I learned a lot of different simple methods of attacking websites, which helped me understand more on how to protect my own websites. So I would recommend trying to do that, trying to explore your website, trying to find every edge case, because that's a great way to imitate the user experience and also find issues with your own product. So that's basically it for the video. Uh, I really appreciate you watching. If you didn't notice, I haven't posted in like two months or three months. This is the longest break I've ever had on YouTube ever since I started this channel uh, four years ago, which is crazy. Um, I'm going to be honest, I was uh, a bit burnt out and I actually thought I quit, I quit YouTube. Um, but there's no way I'm going to quit this channel. There's no way. Uh, I love making YouTube videos. I love uh, providing content for you guys. Um, I feel like sometimes you have setbacks but those are easily um, left behind when you just continue moving forward. Um, and that's what I'm planning on doing. My views are down, but uh, my support has never been greater. So uh, I hope to continue getting the support from you guys. And I'm planning on making a lot more videos. Uh, now that I had a break, I have some ideas that I didn't have before. And also leave ideas in the, in the comments, please. I, I, I feel like I really need to know what you guys want so I can make more videos targeted to my audience. But yeah, that's basically it. Really appreciate you guys watching and I see you guys next time. Peace.